but also, you know, the streets are not full, but, you know, kind of lively too, which is... Yeah, New York was starting to feel like that also. Mm -hmm. I mean, also, New York, the restaurants were open for most of the time. But, you know, also, I was in Brittany, so it was very nice, <laughs> but empty. Yeah. And, you know, you know, the only people you would see yeah. were either small kids or their grandparents. Yeah. <laughs> so, so here you see people in the middle. Which... <laughs> now, 4 p.m., let's give it, you know, one more, one or two more minutes. I see people still coming in. Yeah, there's still more people coming. I need to share the slides while I'm at it, and then we can start. Okay. Okay. So hello everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Jarben House today, uh, who is going to talk to us about the topological complexity of the elastic manifold. And then we will have another talk by uh, Ben McKenna. Jar, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So indeed, I want to talk about this joint work with Paul Bourgard and my colleague Paul Bourgard at Grant and Ben McKenna, our student, who just defended and this was part of his PhD. And he will speak uh, a bit later uh, on a part of this and on the, another topic, which, which is very related. So the, uh, so we'll report on really recent joint works. They were posted a few weeks ago on archive. Here are the numbers. And um, what we do there, so what this talk is about, is what we do in this paper, the first paper, uh, it's to compute the topological complexity of an important model of uh, statistical mechanics, a hard one, which is called the elastic manifold, in, in, in the limit that was uh, computed by Mézard and Parisi in 91, so 30 years ago already. Of course, we don't have the tools that Mézard and Parisi have. We don't have the replica symmetry breaking tools. So uh, things are a little uh, uh, slow on our side. But in fact, this is still very active on the physics side. Uh, and in fact, what prompted us to look at it again was the uh, this recent work by Fyodorov and Le Dussal, Jan Fyodorov and Pierre Le Dussal, last year about what is called the topological trivialization of this model. And, um, and uh, what we do confirm, of course, their work. Uh, we, we compute this topological complexity. I will, of course, say what all that is. I will define the model, spend a lot of time on, on the model itself. And um, using a, a classical tool, which is the Katz-Rice formula, and the Katz-Rice formula, as you know, is a is a very good dictionary that for, transforms question about random geometry into question of random matrix theory. And so, the tool that we use from random matrix theory, what random matrix theory contribute here, is to compute the asymptotics of large random determinants. And this is done in the other paper in rather broad settings, not the usual invariant settings or the, you know, the, the, the explicit models. Uh, so Ben, Ben McKenna will speak about this topic in the second part of, of our seminar. So let me give you a map of the talk. I will first start by quickly, very quickly on this question of random matrix for the moment without anything to do with our model. Uh, of course, I won't spend time in proofs, just tell you what the question is. And then I will go back quickly on the Katz-Rice formula and the question of uh, complexity of random functions. Then talk a little bit about the role of isotropy in those models. Uh, and finally introduce the model, 
of disordered, disordered elastic media or the elastic manifold. Uh, spend some time to not ju just, you know, give you the model as is, because otherwise it's kind of cryptic, why we get there, why it's a very natural model. And then I will give you a summary of what we prove on the complexity of this question of the elastic manifold. So if you haven't heard about the elastic manifold or disordered elastic media, don't worry, this will come. But let me start with something which is very mathematical, which is the, the question that Ben will talk about, which is random determinant in the exponential scale. So we'll just mention what the very simple question is. Take a large random, let's say a real symmetric matrix, Hn, n by n. And the question is, how can you compute the asymptotic of its determinant in the exponential scale? Very natural question. So the question is to understand here in an annealed version, the determinant of Hn, here we will need the absolute value of it, take the expectation, then take one over n log. So this is annealed because I'm looking at a log of expectation. Of course, I could also try to look at, look at expectation of log or just get rid of expectation altogether. So the simplest question is this an yield question. And then, so, so this is really what we want to understand. So let's, you know, naively at this question, the answer is pretty simple because of course the determinant is the product of the eigenvalue. So it's the exponential of the sum of the log of the eigenvalues. If you write it like this, then you can write that this expectation of the absolute value of the determinant is exponential of exponential n times a function of the empirical measure. I call mu hat hn, that's the empirical measure of hn, so one over n sum on the, at the Dirac mass of the Dirac masses at the eigenvalues of hn. And then the function you integrate against it, I mean, psi of mu is just the integral of the log of absolute value of lambda, because I have absolute value of determinant, d mu. So if you forget for a moment that log may be a bit singular at zero at an infinity, just think log is continuous and bounded for the sake of the argument, then this psi of mu n, mu hn, if mu hn converges to some deterministic limit, say mu infinity, then this mu of h, uh, this psi of mu hat of hn should converge to mu of psi of mu infinity. And then if it concentrates fast enough, if you're lucky, you can just put that in the, in, the, uh, in the exponential and then this becomes exponential n times psi of mu of in, in, mu infinity, take one of our n log and you get this result. So it's really tempting to believe that this is the result, right? So if you have, a, if the, the empirical measure of your matrix converges to some deterministic limit, and if you have enough concentration, this should be true, all right? So this is essentially what we proved for in a very broad uh, series of settings. And um, of course, from guessing to proving there is a step and that's done in, the, uh, in this paper and this will be mainly the topic of Ben's talk. So of course, you, you, this looks like a, a question of concentration but the question is, do you have fast enough concentration? You want the, this thing should concentrate faster than N. Of course, if you typically have an HN say sample from the GOE, then of course you have concentration because you even have an LDP in scale N square. So it concentrates much faster than N. But otherwise, how do you do that? Of course, there's a long literature on concentration for the spectral measure. For instance, in the semicircle case or the Wigner case, if you will. So for instance, you have old papers by uh, Alice Guillonet and Ophelzey Tuni 20 years ago and by Bordenav, Caputo and Shafai 10 years ago, many, many others. Uh, I, you know, isolated those two because they are very important for the two proofs we give of this kind, kind of concentration. And then, of course, you also have this question of the singularity of the logarithm at zero and infinity. You have also to tame that. Okay, so what we do, and the answers will be given in Ben's talk, we have two different types of proof for these exponential estimates of random determinant. The results cover a wide range of random matrices. The result we do need in, in this talk about the elastic manifold is about a very specific random matrix, which are block structured Gaussian matrix. And so let me just mention very quickly the result. So here's the type of block structure that we need for the elastic manifold. Imagine that you have a large random matrix made of blocks, uh, which are GOE, the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And then each block is N by N and you have a certain number of blocks. So then the spectrum of this thing is not hard. But then now imagine that to this large series of blocks of GOE, you, you add a very a large deterministic matrix AM. 
right, which will converge, whose spectrum will converge to something. Then we do prove in this paper that we have the asymptotics we want. One of our analog of the expectation of the determinant, here I shift by, by, by a constant value because that will be needed. In fact, is not it doesn't converge yet, but this is the core of the argument, but it's close to the interval of log of lambda minus e mu n d lambda. When this mu n comes from what is called the matrix Dyson equation, as developed recently by Erdős and his collaborators in Vienna. So careful, these are not the Dyson dynamics, the usual Dyson dynamics. The MDE, the matrix Dyson equation is a fantastic tool to understand sharply the, the, the local behavior of, uh, of random matrices. But here we use it for this, for this problem here. And so in, in our application, this, this uh, solution to the matrix Dyson equation, and Ben will mention what that is, converges. In fact, if we assume that the spectrum of AN has a limit. So this thing will converge and then we'll have the limit we want. Okay, so that these five slides were kind of a, a, a short view of what we will need from random matrix to do to solve our question of uh, statistical mechanics. All right, so the next thing that we need is of course the general formalism of katz rice formula and I'm sure many of you have heard that already. So let me be reasonably short on that. So take a smooth function f on a compact manifold of large dimension. Then assume that the function is a Morse function, that is every critical point is non-degenerate. Then every critical point is isolated. And then you have a finite number of critical points because I assume the manifold to be uh, compact. So I see that there are questions coming in, but I... Sorry, I was just putting the link to the slides. Oh, I see, I see, okay. So, uh, Julien, I'll, I'll let you handle if a question comes in to, because I, so that I don't have to read the chat, right? Absolutely. Good. So, um, so the question here, this question, the cat's rice question, is how can you count the number of critical points? So, you may want to count all the critical points. You may want to count a little more precisely the number of critical points of a given index. For instance, the number of local minima, which is index equals zero. I remind you that index is just the, the number of negative eigenvalues of the Hessian, that is the number of direction at a critical point where the function is decreasing. So a local minima has no such direction, and so it's index zero. You may also want to fix, for instance, a range for the value of the function. You may, and, and I mean, all these things can be solved using cats rice. And in particular, in the context we will be in, that is the context of statistical mechanics, F will be an inner energy, a Hamiltonian, in a very large dimensional manifold. And we will want to count the number of local minima, typically, and typically with low values. You may also be interested in more things, like, for instance, the topology of the sub-level sets. So you take a value u, you look at the points where F is less than u, and you want to understand the topology of these level sets for instance, through their Betty numbers. But you could look at other things. You could look at, uh, you know, for instance, the number of com connected components that are, uh, you know, homeomorphic to a, to, a, to a ball, for instance. This type of question, all that can be done. All right, so let me give you an example. Let's look at crit K, the number of critical points of index K, and crit K of F and B, the number of critical points of index K with value in B, where B is a subset of the real law. So this is rather detailed information. You want the number of critical points of a fixed index and values in a fixed set. And here's the cats rice formula. It tells you that the expectation of this thing, which of course is random and your function is random. So of course here I have to assume something on the function. The function will be uh, random, Gaussian, Gaussian here, and smooth enough, of course, because if you want to compute cr uh, critical points in Hessian, you'd better have a smooth F. And this thing is just the integral of the manifold of a simple thing, phi x of zero, that's the density of the law of the Gaussian vector, which is the gradient of F. Something rather simple. So you take the gradient, the density of the gradient at zero, which is reasonable because you're looking at critical points. And the important part is this AK of X, which is here. It's the expectation of the absolute value of the determinant of the Hessian at X, indicator of F of X in B, indicator of the fact that the, Hesh, the index of the Hessian I of X is K, condition on the fact that the point is critical. 
So let's look a minute at this. You have an integral in the manifold. Here you have the density of a Gaussian, an easy thing to compute usually. And here you have this ex expectation. And this is, of course, the expectation of a random matrix. The expectation of the absolute value of the determinant of a random matrix. What is the random matrix? Is the Hessian conditioned by the fact that the point is critical. Forget for the moment these two constraints. So indeed, the scatterized formula establishes a link between the complexity of smooth Gaussian function and random matrix theory when the dimension goes to infinity. And the random matrix is, of course, simply defined by the Hessian. What you have to understand here is the absolute value of the determinant conditioned by the fact that the point is critical. So let's look back to this formula. If this AK, if you could say, as I said in my short introduction to Ben's talk, that this AK, which is the absolute, the expectation of the absolute value of the determinant of a random matrix, behaves like exponential n times something, typically the variance of this uh, Gaussian vector will also be normalized in, in a way to be n. So this phi x of zero will also be an exponential n times something. So you're integrating here exponential n times a function of x. So this seems to belong to the realm of Laplace method. Finding the asymptotics here should not be too difficult. Integrating exponential n something. Except of course that the manifold here has a dimension which also diverges with n. So you have to be a little more prudent than that. But this step will come back at the very end of the talk. Once you understand this term, the expectation of the absolute value of the determinant, then it's kind of downhill to be able to have this uh, the behavior, the asymptotic behavior of this number of critical points. All right. So, of course, one class of example where this task was well understood is when the Gaussian distribution of F if, is isotropic. And more recently, and it's much harder, there's this very nice paper by Tuka, Tuka Finger and, and Zhang, uh, on the case of isotropic increments, which is a, a little more technical. All right. So this is these are the two tools. You, you have the Cassarize formula, which asks for you to understand the, the, the uh, asymptotics of uh, expectation of determinants. And then you have random matrix theory that gives you that. Gérard, can, can I ask a single sure. question? What sort of information that does crit FK give you about, about uh, F? That's a question in topology. All right, so let me come back to Morse theory. So, uh, for instance, here, the Betty numbers. Morse theory tells you, gives you a relationship between those things which are purely topological and the number of critical points. Right? So for instance, the Morse inequalities give you bounds from the critical points. Oh, I see. That's if you're interested in topology. For us, it's it's not what we've done with it. So it might be the time to say that. Uh, I'll say that in one example, is of course you we will you will we, we will see in in most interesting cases that the landscape is very complicated. That you have exponentially many local minima, etc. And you, what you want to understand is when you want to understand first the statics of your model, the Gibbs measure. You want to understand the what's going on with the local with the minima at low values. When you want to understand the dynamics is whether those local minima are accessible when you start from the random points typically and how you transit from one to the other. Okay, So typically, I, I will describe a little bit of that. So indeed, in fact, so before I go there, let me just spend a minute on the, on the, still the general question, which is the role of isotropy. So I just said that in isotropic cases, things were simple. So let's look at that. So what is an isotropic case? You take a Riemannian manifold, you take a Gaussian centered process, and you assume that the covariance is a function of the distance. That's isotropy. Of course, this function is not whatever you want because G of the distance has to be positive definite. Of course, in this case, when you take Y equal X, you see that the variance is constant, it's G of zero. We'll always assume that this variance is one. All right, and in fact, the Gaussian process always induces a metric, which is given by the left-hand side here. And this hypothesis tells you that the two metric, the, the initial metric and, and this one are equivalent. All right, so let's take immediately some very simple examples, which will not be the one that we want here. So take the simplest of all, which is manifold to be the unit sphere. Then the function G such that G of the distance on the sphere is positive definite as have been characterized a long time ago by Isaac Schoenberg. And in, here is the answer. 
If you assume that this function g does not depend on the dimension, the only such functions are these. g of the distance, sum of ap cosine of d to the p. And the important thing is that the ap here are non-negative. And of course, decay fast enough so that the series converges. Another way to write the uh, covariance is to write the covariance not as a function of the distance and the sphere, which is just the angle, if you want, but as a, as a function of the inner product, which the physicists call the overlap, which of course is just the cosine. And so this is exactly this function here, new sum of AR, APRP. And that's the most general isotropic Gaussian field you have on the sphere. We know that since the 40s. And in fact, the, this class is exactly the class that physicists have encountered in the 80s, which is given this way. If you take h of x to be the sum of square root of ap times hp of x, and the hp are simply random homogeneous polynomials, so something like this, where the j's are the couplings, if you know the coefficient of your homogeneous polynomial are iid and zero one. This is, these are the natural model coming from spin glasses on the sphere. And in fact, they correspond exactly to the class, the class introduced by Schoenberg. It's a very easy computation. To compute the covariance of HP it takes one line. So indeed, this very general class of isotropic Gaussian function is a very natural class for physics. It's the class of spherical spin glasses. And this class has been studied very, very hard. So the complexity of this thing has been studied at, you know, uh, for a long time now, and, and the Gibbs measure is now quite well understood at low temperature, at least in certain cases. So this goes back to Fyodorov and his collaborators, then this paper by Tuka, myself, and Yuri Cherny, then a, a, a very beautiful series of work by Eliran Subag and Subag and Zaytuni, more recently by Offinger and Gold, and many others, and in particular this recent work with the Oka Jagannath on uh, on the higher temperature, what is called the shattering phase. So this is a long story. I don't want to get into that. Let me just say a word. So that, then I would answer, this answers a little bit what uh, Julien was saying. The usual approach, the asking, the usual approach to study Gibbs, uh, Gibbs measures for spin glasses is not to study the topological complexity. The approach is the approach that Parisi introduced in order to compute the, uh, the most important thing initially, which is the free energy, Parisi said that there was a variational formula, which was based on uh, the, the overlap distribution. And, and this, of course, and of course, the proof of the physicist was based on the replica trick, which makes no sense for us. And then, of course, you have this long literature, which, uh, which established the Parisi formula not using the replica trick, rather you're using the cavity method. And essentially that's the work of uh, Talagrand based on work by Guerra, Bolthausen, uh, many others, Jaganat, Ofinger, of course, Penchenko. Uh, so this is kind of understood, but this approach here more recently has given sharper results. Uh, because for instance, it's, and, and in particular, the description of the Gibbs measure that you obtain using this topological picture to answer Julien, is much sharper. And, and then, uh, for instance, just to mention this last result, I wouldn't have spent time there, but since Julien asked, um, you know, we this approach gives you a, a geometric description of the Gibbs measure, not simply the distribution of the overlap, which means what is the distribution of the inner product of two points taken at random under the Gibbs measure. There's much more to the Gibbs measure than this, this, this overlap. And in particular, when you are, even when you are in a replica symmetric phase where the replica method, I mean, the, the Parisi picture makes no difference between the uniform measure and a spin glass. In fact, the, the Gibbs measure of the spin glass is very complicated. In particular, it's shattered at a low enough, high enough temperature, but not too high. And, um, you know, which this information is not accessible through the Parisi picture. So the complexity, in fact, gives you a much more detailed picture. And in particular, this picture is the one you need to understand dynamics at when you start, you know, at, at high enough temperature, when you start from a random point. And that, that was the real motivation initially for all this. All right. So 
In this case, let's come back to what we do here. The first step to understand all this complexity is to understand the, uh, the, the random determinant I mentioned. And in this case, because it's isotropic, the random matrix is a simple modification of the GOE. So you have the whole arsenal of a random metric theory accessible, including large deviations. And this is what is used in all those, uh, this long series of work. Now, let, let me give you another model, which is on Rn rather than on the sphere. So, which has been studied a lot. In fact, going back to uh, questions about turbulence, going back to Yaglom, for instance, and in part a lot by Fyodorov and his collaborators recently. So you take, a, now the manifold is Rn, and you take an isotropic centered field, Vn. So isotropic means, again, that the covariance is a function, B here, of the distance. Forget all those normalizations. They are just the usual normalizations of physics here. So the full classification of the possible B, like we had on the sphere, has also been done on our end. It goes also back to Schoenberg and was redone by Jaglom in 57. And this, the class of such functions is well, is well understood. Like the, the class of, of such functions on the sphere was, was, was well understood. Here is the kind of, kind of B that are allowed. It's a, co a constant C0 plus such an integral. And nu here is a finite positive measure. So we will always assume that B is differentiable enough, which of course is an assumption on nu, and that the, 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 first, the value and the first two derivatives are non-zero to avoid degeneracies. All right, so that's a very general class of isotropic functions on Rn. You cannot, of course, simply count the number of critical points on Rn because that might well be infinity. You could count the number of critical points of this Vn in a ball, in a sphere, let's say, I'm sorry, in a ball. But what physicists does usually is not that. You just add a confining potential. So you take this L2 norm, if you want, a harmonic well, and you add this to this random noise. This harmonic well, when mu is large, tends to confine a lot. And so then you may expect that this thing has a finite number of critical points, and it's the case. So this is like, our spherical spin glass, but we would call that a soft spin glass in an isotropic well, because the well here is isotropic. It's just the L2 norm. And then you can ask yourself the same question about the topological complexity of this model. This has been done in depth by Fyodorov and his collaborators in the 2000s. And of course, this goes back to Mézar and Parisi and others in, in, the eight, in the end of the 80s and beginning of the 90s. Again, here, because of the isotropy, the random matrix is a simple modification of the GOE and things are simple. So, oops, sorry. All right, so here I gave you two very, very classical models of spin glasses. And now let me give you one model, which is not at all classical, which seems a little far-fetched initially, but which is the one that will be behind the question about the elastic manifold. So it's a very, very simple modification that we study in this paper with uh, Paul and Ben. So I just do the following simple modification. Instead of taking the, U, the, the L2 norm here, I just study the same thing, the same random noise, but in an iso anisotropic well. So Dn here is just a real symmetric positive matrix. Okay. So if you want, this is a soft spin glass in an anisotropic well. Seen like that, it seems a little gratuitous to study that, but we'll see that it's important. So we'll see in fact that this is important to understand the elastic manifold when you have in dimension zero. Of course, we don't want to study dimension zero. So again, you can ask the same questions about the topological complexity of this model. And then if you follow what I've set up to now, the first thing you have to do is to compute the Hessian of this. Obviously, the random matrix here, the Hessian of this Vn, of this Hn, which is clearly the Hessian of Vn. So something like what we've seen before, the Hessian of a Gaussian isotropic uh, field, so it's related to the GOE. And then the Hessian here of this quadratic term is obviously dn, maybe multiplied by mu. So now you're looking at a fixed matrix dn plus a GOE. This, of course, is the realm of free convolution. Okay, so you would expect that the spectral measure of that would converge. So if you assume for just for a minute that the eigenvalues of dn are bounded away from zero infinity and that the spectral measure of dn converges to something, let's say mu d, then you can compute the total complexity. 
So here's the first result. Whatever n log of the expectation of the number of critical points of this is a certain function of this limiting mu d and mu b second, b second of zero, which correspond to a, a variance, if you want. It's, it's a characteristic, it's the amount of noise that you have. Remember, b characterized the, in fact, the, the, the covariance structure of the noise. So this is an exact formula. And this sigma tot, total is given by this variational principle. It's minus log, the integral of log, log lambda against the deterministic thing. And then you have a soup in u in the, on the real line of this thing. And of course here, this is the free convolution between mu d and the semicircle. Semicircle of radius determined by b, in fact, square root of 2b. All right, so here you have a variational problem. And this is an explicit formula for the complexity function. And the important thing, so just to, is that if you analyze this thing, this complexity vanishes for low enough noise. So if b second of zero is small enough and it's positive above this threshold, exactly. So this is exactly what an example of topological trivialization. That is when you have not enough, not much noise, the, uh, this function is simple. This Hamiltonian, if you want, is simple. And when you have a lot of noise, then this, uh, this uh, Hamiltonian is exponentially complex. The number of critical points is exponentially large. In fact, so I said above the threshold, this variational problem can be solved. It's a little bit painful. I won't show you that. And you can go in enough detail to even understand the transition, the topological transition. When the noise goes to this critical value of the noise, from above, then the complexity vanishes quadratically. And you can do the same for the complexity of minima, as long as dn has no outliers. And the topological transition from complex to non-complex is at the same value of bc, but except of having a quadratic transition, you have a cubic one. So in fact, to do this, sharp analysis, you need to understand the variational pr principle I gave you above. And that's a rather delicate step, step which is used, done using Berger's equation for the semicircle. And a rather recent inequality by Alice Guillonet and Milen Maida. So I won't go there, I'll just give you the result in this kind of artificial uh, spin glass in an anisotropic well, here's what we can do. And now we can go to the topic of the talk, which is the disordered elastic media or the elastic manifold. So here's a quotation by uh, Yamarki from, uh, on, on what, what this is. So as physicists always say, many, I mean, lots of system uh, can be uh, described under the unifying concept of disordered elastic media. And in all these systems an internal elastic structure is subjected to the effects of disorder. And of course, you want to understand how these two things fight. The elastic structure wants to make things simple. The disorder wants to make things hard. And I, I use this quotation because of the second sentence. A specially interesting feature for all this system is that these disordered elastic structures can be set in motion. So we're talking now about dynamics by applying an external force in them and that the motion will be drastically affected by the presence of disorder. What property result from this competition is extremely complicated and et cetera. So this transition is what physicists call pinning, depinning transition. When you see such an elastic structure being pinned and it's hard to move and then you depin it ab above a certain amount of force. So that's typically what people really want to understand on those things. All right, so let's look at what the model is. So first I start in the continuum because maybe in the continuum it's much, I could give you the model right, right like that, but it's kind of opaque. So let me start with a very natural model. So take an open subset of RD, omega. And now you look at the following energy functional on the space of smooth function, U defined on omega with values in Rn. So I have two dimensions here. X if you want is in RD and U of X is in Rn. And you look at the following energy h of u is the integral of the norm of grad u squared. So that's the elastic term. And you put it in a potential. You integrate on omega now v of x and u of x. v is smooth potential. 
All right, which of course depends on the value of u and the place x. Very, very natural energy functional. The, for, the natural question is to ask very classically about minimizing it. Find a u's minimizing u, a, minimizing h of u. Of course, under a decent boundary condition, Dirichlet, periodic, whatever you, you want. Then, just to insist, this model includes two integers, d, physicists call the internal dimension, and n, which is the dimension in the field as well as two other things, of course, the open set omega and the potential V, right? So you have this elastic energy and a potential, very natural model. Typically, you will start as we did before by confining, uh, with the confining, so the potential would be a confining potential, an L2 norm typically, the harmonic potential, and then you add disorder. Vn here will be, got, will be a random. For simplicity, you assume that Vn of x dot as a function of u, it's a centered Gaussian smooth function, isotropic on Rn, for fixed x. And from one x to the other, you assume that there is fast decorrelation. So this is really serious noise. And so then your Hamiltonian become this, the elastic term, integral of grad u square, the bounding, the confining potential, the L2 norm, and then the random disorder, right? So we have three terms. Of course, the first term, they play a different role. The first term, the elastic term, wants the function to be flat. If you want to minimize, you want the gradient to be zero, the function, you want it to be flat. The second term, you want this, the L2 norm to be small. So you want the function to be close to zero. You want to confine it. And the third term, of course, which is random, adds disorder and complexity. So one, the, the, the other ones want the function to be smooth and tame and flat. The other wants to make it complex. Of course, if you're ambitious, you may want to look, and what, of course, physicists do that. You're not simply interested in minimizing H, but maybe constructing the Gibbs measure, which would be exponential minus beta H of U, DU, normalized. Of course, DU doesn't make sense. And so, of course, one natural way to look at these things is to, I mean, it doesn't make sense for us. For physicists, it does, but not for us. So the natural way to do that is to uh, discretize. So let's discretize the model. And now we have the three terms. This is the, so now let, let me take the, 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 the open set omega to be a cube, a discrete cube, one L from to the D. So this is a discrete box in dimension D. And now here I have my Gaussian noise, which as before has this kind of general isotropic uh, covariance. And here I put a Dirac mass, which is to say that when I take two different points in the box, the two noises are independent. So the noise structure is just a bunch of IID copies of the noise I had before. Then you have the L2 norm. And then you have the, the elastic term, which after a very easy integration by part is just this. So this is this, the sum of on, of on the pairs where x is a neighbor to y of the u of x minus u of y square. So this is the model, okay? Of course, the disorder, as I said, is IID in x and isotropic in u. So let's look at this model when L is one, if you want, when your box is just, or D equals zero, which means when your, your box is just one point, one site. So look at this when your box, so then this term is not there. You have only one such term, and this is exactly the, uh, you know, the uh, harmonic well with an uh, isotropic noise. So that's exactly the model we had before, the soft spin glass in a harmonic potential. But now, so what do we have here? This general model is you have this big box. At every side, you have such model of a soft spin glass, but they are interacting and the interacting interaction is an elastic interaction that wants to tame them, right? They want to make them as constant as possible, right? So the, the elastic interaction is kind of uh, smoothing the uh, craziness of the spin glasses. All right, so in special cases, here's the model. When D is one, here's the model. You sum from one to L of this thing. This is the L2 norm, this is the noise. So if you look at this model, I mean, of course we know it. When L goes to infinity, this model is just a directed polymer. This is just you know, a directed polymer in a random potential, of course, with a harmonic a bounding potential here. So th this class of model contains many, many things. So for instance, all the questions about directed polymer, this is a, a way to touch KPZ type, type of things. 
This also touches a lot of random interfaces models. When n is d plus one, of course, then u will be an interface. Again, when the, the discretization goes to, I mean, l goes to infinity, there's are many, many models of random interfaces are included in this one. That's not the limit that we're going to look at. We are looking at a, a limit, which is the one that Parisi and, and Mezard did in the, in the 80s and 90s, is D and L are fixed here, but N is going to infinity, right? That's a mean field type limit, if you will. This problem was really studied massively and back to Fisher, Dan Fisher in 86, and then Mezard and Parisi, and it has been active all along. For instance, this paper by Le Doussal, Muller and Wies is very important. And more recently, this work by Fyodorov and Le Doussal in 2020. All right, so here's again the model. Here I just add now added two constant A and B, two free parameters, so that you can play with, uh, with the relative strengths of the different things. And we impose here the periodic boundary condition. We could have chosen another one, but this one makes things a little simpler. And so here's this Hamiltonian. I write it again this way. But just So I have here the identity, mu zero times the identity minus T zero times the discrete Laplacian. U of X, U of Y. This term is the sum of these two terms, if you look at them, when mu zero and T zero are defined in terms of A and B. And then you have the sum of this thing, which is the disorder. So this equation 26 is really the model that we're looking at. So here you have two parameters. Mu zero is what is usually called the mass, or the square root of the mass. And, and T zero is the elasticity constant. And delta is, of course, the periodic lattice Laplacian. And again, as before, V is a, a smooth Gaussian field, which is isotropic. And we avoid degeneracies. So that's the model after a long time. So here are the results we have on this model. So what we do is the following. We compute the annealed topological complexity of this Hamiltonian. Again, in the limit when n goes to infinity and DLL are fixed. <coughs> and we compute the logarithmic behavior of the total number of critical points and of local minima. This complexity is given by a rather complicated variational problem, which we do solve. And then using that, we show that there is a sharp transition, as in the simple example I gave before, between a region of positive complexity and a region of vanishing complexity. So it's a form, again, of topological trivialization when the mass is high enough or when the noise is slow, low enough. And we understand that this transition is at a natural thing for physicists, which is called the Larkin mass. All right, and those, reform, those results confirm fully what Fyodorov and Ledoussal predicted. All right, so what, do not, what we do not do, you know, if you go back to the, the things, again, to the question by Julien, or to the thing I described about the sp spherical spin glasses, there, Subag managed to compute the quench complexity, at least in some regions. So here, we do not yet compute the quench complexity, which is, of course, harder. And since we do not understand the quench complexity yet, we cannot yet study the Gibbs measure at positive temperature. The complexity question that we have here is a zero temperature question. And of course, what we did in, sp in spin glasses was to lift the temperature up and to understand the structure, the geometric structure of the Gibbs measure. We are not there yet. And then since we don't understand yet the Gibbs measure, we cannot add a force. So we believe our friends in physics, but we do not yet see, of course, how this transition might be used to prove the pinning, depinning transition. Of course, they tell us how it is supposed to happen, but this is not done yet mathematically. And then the next question, all these questions are uh, static. The next question would be to understand dynamically how this depinning would happen when the force is high enough. Okay, so these are four very difficult and interesting and important questions, which uh, we do not yet touch. Everybody is invited to think about it if, if they want. We will probably also try to think about these things. All right, so here is our results uh, mathematically stated. So let's n taught be the random number of all critical points of the elastic manifold Hamiltonian. Then we do prove that the total complexity, one over n to the LD, which is the total number of variable, but here the only thing that goes to infinity is n, logarithm of the expectation of this number of critical point has an explicit form. 
And similarly, if you look at the number of local minima, you also have a similar formula, except these two functions, the two complexity functions, sigma and sigma minimum, are explicit and different. So here's the explicit formula. So consider the real symmetric matrix of size LD, which is given by this. This is the identity multiplied by mu zero. This is the discrete Laplacian with periodic boundary condition multiplied by T zero. And then you look at the spectral measure. Everybody can compute the eigenvalues of this operator on the discrete box. And so that's this thing, which of course depends on L and D. And then I denote by sigma B the semicircle again, the radius two square root B. Then here's the variational formula. The complexity is given by this, one over LD log of the determinant of this simple thing. And then again, a variational problem, which is very similar to what I showed you before. Here we used to have mu d, so that's exactly this thing. And the complexity for minima is the same shape, with again the free convolution here, except that the soup, instead of take, being taken on the whole real line, is for u less than l. And this l, which is a function of the, of the mass and the elastic constant, is the left end of the support of this free convolution. So we have explicit formula. At this point, as I show them now, they are not completely explicit because I still have a variational formula. But I'm telling you that, that in fact, this supremum can be computed. Again, it's painful. I won't show you that. It's in the paper. And from there, we can deduce the following. You define for a given elastic constant T0 and a given noise, B, which was this B second of zero, you define the Larkin mass as the unique solution mu C to this equation. Again, what's on the left-hand side is very simple. This is the discrete Laplacian with periodic boundary condition. You can compute this critical, this empirical spectral measure. This defines a unique mu C. And then when you have this mu C, we show that when the mass is larger than this mu C, the total and the minimal minima complexity vanish. So when the mass is strong enough, when the confining force is strong enough, you lose complexity. A large enough mass kills the exponential complexity of the landscape. When, on the contrary, of course, I should say that here, when mu is strictly less than mu c, then the complexity and the uh, minima complexity are exponentially large. The, the landscape, this elastic manifold, has a transition at this mu c, which is extremely complex, which comes from non-complex to complex. If you don't want to talk about mass, you can talk about noise. You could define BC in terms of this, uh, the same type of critical thing. And now when the noise level is too small, right? you have a simple landscape. When the noise level is larger than this critical value, you have a complicated landscape. And so when I said here that the complexities are positive below the Larkin mass and they are explicit, because again, the supremum can be computed. And uh, let me express now quickly the phase transition at this Larkin mass. And I express it in terms of the noise level. I could do it in terms of the mass, but I will do it here in terms of the noise level. We have something similar than I was giving you before. When you approach this no noise level from above, so you are in the complex phase and you're going to the non-complex phase, then the total, the complexity vanishes quadratically and the complexity of minima comp vanishes cubically. All that was predicted by the physicist, and we do prove that. Of course, we also have expression for this constants here. So we have a rather complete understanding of the complexity of the anneal complexity and of the transition, of the topological transition. So remember, the lesson is simple. Above a certain level of noise, this, the, 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 the landscape is glassy, as they say, that is exponentially complex. And below, it's simple. Of course, you could ask yourself now many more questions. When you are in the glassy phase, what kind of replica symmetry breaking do you have at low temperature? As I said, we haven't yet touched that. I would bet that it's a one RSB phase. So I have to close. And here is the last slide, which is the proof in a nutshell. And I essentially gave you everything during the talk to see those different points. So you start, you have this now, this Hamiltonian, which is in dimension L n times L to the D. 
you, so you have you know, this random Hamiltonian at any point of a box of size LD, and you have this interaction. It's still a Gaussian field, smooth, so you can apply cat's rise. Then the next step is to compute the distribution of the Hessian, conditioned by the fact that the point is critical. Because everything is Gaussian, conditioning a, a Hessian by, a, by a, a gradient is not too hard. It's linear algebra. You can do it. You can compute the distribution of the Hessian. And what do you find is that you find that this Hessian has the structure I mentioned before. That is, it's essentially a large matrix of size NLD with blocks on the diagonal of size N, which are all GOEs. And to this, you add this very large, this, the matrix given by the, by the uh, 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 Laplacian. So now you have this, you are in the free convolution regime. You have a discrete large deterministic matrix to which you add this random number of copies of GOEs. And then you apply the result I started with on our companion paper on the random determinant of this matrix for this block structure Gaussian matrix. And now in your cat's rights, you know how the determinant behaves. So as I mentioned before, you can try to apply a Laplace formula. And you do, and you get a very heavy variational formula in a very high dimension, in the L to the D dimensions. It's very untractable. And at this point, normally you throw your hands up and it's over. But here, this variational problem in L to the D can be in fact simplified to the one I just mentioned, which is in one dimension through really a miracle. Uh, there is a real miracle happening here, which is an unexpected convexity. So through that miracle, the variational formula is becomes reducible to one dimension, which is much easier and then solvable. And when you look at this problem in one dimension, what you realize is that it's exactly the model in dimension zero that I mentioned before. It's a spin glass model, a soft spin in an anisotropic random potential. And this anisotropy here is not abstract, like in the model I gave you before. It's just the anisotropy due to the discrete Laplacian. And once you understand the you know, theorem I gave you then on this anisotropic models, then you can use them here. And from there, you can deduce all the results on the topological complexity and the topological transition for the elastic manifold that I just gave you. And with this, uh, I close. Thanks, Gerard, for this Thank beautiful talk. Thank you very much. Oh, you're back, Julia. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, <laughs> just the time to, to unmute myself. So are there any questions for, for Gérard for this lovely talk? Okay, can I, can I ask a, a very naive question, which maybe will show that I don't understand very much. But uh, so, so, so is there any, any link here with, so, so when you were presenting those, those random Gaussian Function. I was, I was wondering whether or not you could get things which looks more like uh, the, the 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 Gaussian free field or things like that here. I mean, is there a link with that, or, or is this completely different? And yes, yes, of course, of course it is. Of course it is. This is if you forget the potential. This is the and you take a, a limit which we do not take here. You mm -hmm. take the limit when L goes to infinity, which means mm -hmm. your discretization becomes yeah. smaller. This is of course a Gaussian free field, mm -hmm. massive. I put a mass in it, right? Okay. So it's not the massless free field, right? Mm -hmm. So to come back to the initial question I gave you where you had this Gibbs measure with a DU, right? And I said, physicists know how to do that. If we wanted to do that, of course, in this limit, we would have the Gaussian free field, massive. Mm -hmm. And this would give a meaning to this DU, I mean, exponential, I mean, the Gaussian thing. Of course, on a space of function, which will not be smooth. And then you will have the... Uh, uh, you would have to add to this the uh, the, the random noise, right? Which, uh, which, so this is, of course, when I made the link, for instance, with the polymer, this is what you, what you have. Let me come back to, oops, let me come back to this. You will see it immediately doing ornstein Uhlenbeck, right? And then you add this, and then you have a polymer, right? So in, in more generality, the model, which is here, look at this. If you get rid of Vn, this is, of course, the limit of that. Of course, to give a meaning to this, when you take the Gibbs measure, would be the Gaussian. Uh, 
free field, and here you add a mass, right? But, and then you add a potential. But that's not the limit we're taking because we're not here doing L go to infinity. It is in fact an interesting question, which is on our table too, to look at what's going on when L and N go to infinity. Right, which is, is there any chance that you can, you know, describe some topological aspect of the Gaussian free field that are not attainable otherwise with this method? Yeah, I would say yes, but I don't, I mean, I would, you would have to be prudent here. <laughs> Because of course, you know, the, what, what we're doing here, we're talking about smooth functions, mm. right? The, the landscape is smooth. Mm. When, you, when you go to the limit, you know, it won't be smooth, right? So, so one has to be careful. May I ask a question? Sure. sure. Uh, oh, somebody who knows something about it. <laughs> uh, no, I have one question and one comment, in fact. Uh, question is, uh, what are conditions under which uh, these nice results, one is a tropic uh, uh, situation that you showed in, in D equals zero. I mean, uh, whole, because I could imagine, for example, that this sequence of muens, I don't know, grow, Uh, say fast and uh, it does not converge to I mean to something. Definitely, it should be some condition. Yeah, so that's what we're saying here. You let here. I just assume that the the, the, the eigenvalues of your dn are bounded away from zero and infinity, which of course in the case of the ah. Laplacian is is clear. Ah, okay. 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 okay, okay. So that you don't touch those two things. Of ah. course, you could you could try to be smarter if you want to, if you have a specific model in, in mind. Here we have the Laplacian in mind, so the eigenvalues mm -hmm. are bounded away. And then, of course, you want the spectral measure to converge. But ah, by ah, the way, ah. Ben will talk about this type of thing. So this is this is done in the other paper, ah, right? This, this and, 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 and the, uh, we didn't have this problem of singularity because the mm -hmm. Laplacian you, you control the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, ju just a small comment that you you said that for uh, zero temperature, I mean, which is basically this uh, model, you you cannot ask a question about uh, depinning. I don't think uh, that that's correct, right? Uh, you can add uh, the force and ask uh, when it uh, really uh, complexity. I mean, this uh, topological complexity vanishes. This is really the yeah, definition right. of. Of the penny is just uh, that you need an annealed, but even with with uh, sorry qu quenched, but even with annealed, you can get some useful bounds on that. We 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 did this with no, here. No, in, you're in, right, in of course, world. but I, I wanted to talk directly about this the dynamical thing. We could do, in fact, dynam dynamics at zero temperature too, but it's they are a little uh, more difficult. Mm -hmm. But you're right. The, on the complexity side, we could ask, we could add a force. In fact, for instance, for spin glasses, this is what we did when we went into statistics, when you, we added a signal, which was the tensor PCA model with uh, Andrea Montanari and then uh, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, Mika, uh, Mikhail Nika and Song Mei, or when we studied the dynamics with Jaganath and Gesari. But so here we could do the same kind of thing. You're right. You're right. Thank you. There is in a, fact, uh, when I said, you know, when I said that we believe our physicist friends, I was including you in there. So <laughs> I believe that we can do that, but we, we don't know how to do that now. There is a question in the chat for you, Gérard. Yes. Yangu, asking, uh, can the random determinant results be applied to the case of generalized block structured matrices where the block can also be off diagonals? Yes, there is a general result like that. Maybe Ben, so first I would refer to the paper and maybe to the talk by Ben. Yes, there, but of course you have to be prudent. There are all sorts of assumptions that you have to make, but yes, it's not restricted to the diagonal thing. Thanks. Are there any, any more questions for Gérard? So if not, uh, I propose that we all unmute ourselves to thank Gérard uh, again for his very lovely talk. And that we take now a five minute break. And because Gérard finished bang on time, that means that we can reconvene uh, at um, uh, three past five in five minutes. <laughs>